what do you think about Israel, you know, protesting against Netanyahu? Is that productive? Unproductive? Do you think he's doing a good job? Do you think he's doing a bad job? Do you think he's the right guy for the job, not the right guy for the job? Doesn't matter. He's there. He's the commander in chief. Do you believe you that he was appointed by God to be there right now in that position? Is there anything godly about that position? Everything is by divine plan. Why not this? Hey. All right, Rabbi Manus Freeman, thank you for joining us here tonight. Obviously, the world is talking about what happened uh, in Israel recently, um, being attacked by Iran. And uh, there's a lot of speculation right now as to was it a victory for Israel? Was it not a victory for Israel? And I would love to hear your perspective on what are some potential next steps as to what you think should be going on from a Torah perspective in the coming days and weeks. Well, you know, we can off, we can talk about a Torah perspective. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have a good strategy because the circumstances are unique in each case and it has to be applied you know like surgically but there's no question that this was an incredible miracle i mean this is a miracle of biblical proportions yeah we're not talking about a ragtag group of terrorists with their with their rockets we're talking about a very sophisticated army and that Israel seems to be protected by an invisible wall. And that's that's really a, a major miracle. And anyone who doesn't see it just doesn't want to see it. I'm sure Iran saw it. So, yeah, it was a victory in that it discourages further attacks. They would have to be very desperate to try again. But I'm sure they are desperate and they probably will try again. Maybe differently, maybe something else. But, but here's the real issue. Iran has been a problem for a very long time. You know, to treat it as if Iran just now became a player, that, that's simply not true. Iran has been a player for a long time, maybe since the 60s. That's a long time. And Israel didn't do anything about it in all these years, which is a mistake. You know how in medicine, even the best medicines that are most effective for the disease for which it's prescribed Almost every one of them has side effects. If it's good for the liver, it's not good for the kidney. If it's good for the heart, it's not good for the lungs. If it's good for the heart, it's not good for the brain. There's always a downside. And you have to read the counterindication. The same is true with secular uh, rules of engagement. The Geneva Conference came up with rules for war. They're good up to a point. They have really bad side effects. Mm. So, for example, I don't remember in like in biblical times, if a nation attacked another nation, you never saw them say, if you do that again, you're going to get it. <laughs> There's never if you do that again. You attacked, you're in trouble. This modern thinking, you know, don't don't react immediately. Give a warning. Don't let them do it again. And if they do it a second time, give them a stronger warning. If they're not afraid of you 
and they're willing to do a first strike, what, what, what is a warning going to do? They know what you're capable of, and they, and they, and they challenged you. They attacked. So what are you saying? I'm warning you. What, what does that even mean? It means I'm giving you another chance. And the question is, why? Why are you giving someone who attacked you another chance? It does not make moral sense. <clears throat> Almost all the rules that were passed or established in the Geneva Conference, they're all a little suicidal. They sound nice on paper, but they cost lives in real in the real world. The Torah attitude is, if someone is threatening you, they are a full-fledged enemy, and you should retaliate to the threat. If they can threaten and you do nothing, you're encouraging war. You're encouraging an attack. If they can attack once and you don't retaliate, you just warn them, you're highly immoral. Hmm. you're making it okay to start a war you've already made it okay to threaten war now you've made it okay to actually fire the first shot this is not moral not even safe it encourages war it does not save lives. We've seen it so many times, over and over. Do we not know that Hezbollah is a threat? That Lebanon is a threat? Well, they haven't done anything yet. You don't live with a threat. That's what a sovereign government is. It makes life safe for its citizens. Living under a threat is not safe. Well, they've only fired a few rockets. That's nonsense. So the so, Jewish... Go ahead. Sorry. The Torah attitude is a threat of war is a declaration of war. You don't let that stand. Cold war is nerve-wracking. It's war on your nerves. Hmm. You don't tolerate that if you're a sovereign state. You don't you don't uh, subject your citizens to that kind of to that kind of tension. Living in peace means living with peace of mind. Are you suggesting an offensive? I can't suggest anything because I don't know the uh, circumstances and what's possible or what's not possible. They know. They don't need advice. Who is they? they don't, the Israel. idea? Yeah. They, don't, they don't need to be told how to fight a war. I think they need to be given a green light. It's okay to retaliate to a threat. It's the moral thing to do. You don't wait until somebody gets killed before you retaliate. That's not called self-defense. That's called mere survival. Mm. Self-defense means no one in their right mind is going to dare attack you or even threaten you. 
we live in peace in Israel, in America because nobody threatens except Iran. Why do they get away with that? They shouldn't. Why do they get away with it? Because of this crazy policy of, well, they haven't shot us yet. They haven't killed us yet. Even though they did get did attack American troops in different places on the globe, American embassies. Well, we warned them not to do it again. Oh, that's, that is so immoral. Well, look, we all want a, a world in which there is zero tolerance for terrorism, for war, for aggression. Zero tolerance. What are we doing to achieve zero tolerance? advocating more and more tolerance. Mm -hmm. It's not going to get us where we want to be. It, it's, it's reckless, it's foolish, and it's childish. Not moral. But what would have happened we're into, what, 180 days now? More than six months? What would have happened if Israel had used a very ancient and very time-tested method of throwing a siege on a city? Put the city under siege. You're worried about the hostages? You're worried about tunnels? Fine. Cut off the electricity, cut off the water. In a week, it's all over. The war would have been over in a week. Because you can't go for a week without water. So I think one of the reasons why Israel is capitulating so much is, um, and everybody, yes, I shut off the comments. So thank you for all your messages. Um, I think one of the reasons why Israel is capitulating so much is because they're under pressure from the United States of cutting off uh, funding, of cutting off arms, of cutting off all of these things. How real is that or how not real is that? I mean, we saw last night that our allies did step up. Of course, it was God. Of course, it was a shim. Of course, it was, you know, but at the end of the day, the Iron Dome is funded by the United States. The UK and the Allies in America were there. Um, so I think that Israel is scared that if they do, in fact, uh, not listen, that they're, they're going to lose that ally, which is a, as much as we want to say we're brave and we trust in God and all these things, it's a real thing. Of course, it's a real thing, but is it to our benefit or to our detriment? Mm -hmm. If your best friends turn out to be killing you, you say, well, we got to stay friends. And I'm not so sure. America is not going to cut off aid to Israel. It's politically correct for them to say, we're going to pressure you, we're going to demand. They don't expect us to obey like, like children. A number of times in past administrations where the government said, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then Israel followed their instruction and they were shocked. Why did you do that? <laughs> like giving back the Sinai with the oil field. America was shocked. Are you crazy? Well, you said. We didn't think you'd actually do it. Give away oil fields? <laughs> that is so insanely suicidal. So we got to be a little more uh, perceptive 
But politicians say things for different reasons, for different interests, and for different ears. Mm. This statement was meant for them to hear. The other statement was meant for those to hear. We we can't be victims of this of this world of falsehood. I, I would say that the biggest problem in the world today is the absolute absence of truth. It's not that people lie. People have always lied. It's not that politicians are dishonest. It comes with the territory. But there was always a healthy respect for the truth so that if you're lying, you don't admit you're lying. You try to make it sound like it's the truth. Nobody bothers anymore. Every statement you hear is questionable. And we all know it. How many civilians were killed in Gaza? You have no idea. Because mm -hmm. who are you going to trust? And it's not that we're suspicious. We're not suspicious. We're fully aware that no one tells the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is gone, not only in politics, in every area of life, in everything. There is no truth. There's no, there's no attempt at it. There's no respect for it. There's no need for it. We live in a world of the best lie wins. And we're okay with that. We're okay with that. I can't get over the advertisements on, on the radio, on television, for medications. They tell you this is a great medicine. It'll make you so much healthier. It'll make your life so much easier. If it doesn't kill you, give you a stroke, make you blind and crippled. I, I, how does this work? They give you a full minute of side effects some of them pretty seriously. And then say, so what are you waiting for? Order now. You know, if these ads didn't work, they wouldn't run them. These ads work. You tell the people this can kill you, but it'll take away your allergy. And you go ahead and use it. The lie is more appealing than the truth. I, I know it's a hard question, and maybe you won't be able to answer it, but you're somebody that spends so much time by the Lubavitcher Rebbe, and you absorb so much of his teachings. Undoubtedly, the Rebbe would be speaking about this subject day and night right now. Yeah? He was, a, he was, he was up to world politics? No, he what? was up. It was up to morality. Morality. What do you think? I'm not going to hold you to it. But what do you think his message would be right now in this time to Israel? The Rebbe very often gave military and political advice to the leaders in Israel. They came to the Rebbe for advice. Begin, when he was prime minister, came to the Rebbe for advice. That is not public knowledge, as you know, it shouldn't be. In the 67 war, the Rebbe advised that they enter the countries they're fighting with. Mm. Go into Lebanon, go into Egypt. Otherwise, the people won't know they're at war. And that encourages another war. But they, they didn't follow that advice, and there was another war. Ten years later. So the devil would give literally military advice. 
one of the things that really surprised me was, and, and you know, the some some of this information kind of leaks out after many years. Obviously, many years ago, there was a well, it was it was General Sharon. He was the hero of the Yom Kippur War in the Sinai. The Rebbe asked him a question that took him by surprise. The Rebbe asked him, have you ever determined what is the viscosity of the sand in the Sinai? Because you have to determine the viscosity to be able to devise treads on a tank that will be most efficient. Sharon was like, what's viscosity? Meaning this wasn't spiritual advice. It was real, practical, brass tacks advice. Yeah, cutting so edge. You th again, I don't want to put words in your mouth and I don't want to lead you in a way that I... But you think that he would the Rebbe would advise to go into Iran? Well, I don't know. What I'm saying is the Rebbe's public announcements, pronouncements, was always a matter of morality. Mm -hmm. Strategy is not meant to, to be public. I don't understand this. Israel announced a date for when they're going to enter Rafa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What, what kind of craziness is this? But so did Iran, to be fair. Iran announced the date that they're going into, that they're sending the drones into Israel. And people are saying, and people are saying that... I, I never said that they were smarter than us. <laughs> it's a ridiculous thing to do. A ceasefire is a ridiculous thing to do. Mm-hmm. Letting in trucks, hundreds of trucks into enemy territory, it's suicidal. It, it is unheard of. It is this childish attempt at fighting a nice, friendly little war. It's absurd. It's absolutely senseless. Another question for you. What do you think about... Um, about Israel, you know, protesting against Netanyahu. Is that productive, unproductive? Do you think he's doing a good job? Do you think he's doing a bad job? Do you think he's the right guy for the job, not the right guy for the job? Doesn't matter. He's there. He's the commander in chief. Do you believe you that he was appointed by God to be there right now in that position? Is there anything godly about that position? Everything is by divine plan. Why not this? Nobody expected him to become prime minister again. Mm -hmm. But here he is. So the right thing to do is encourage him. Mm -hmm. Demand that he do a good job. Don't undermine him when he's in charge. It's ridiculous, no? It, it's It's treason. It's ridiculous. Although I was in Israel a few weeks ago, and I was just asking the local taxi drivers and the waiters and the whatever, whoever was around, and I would say, how do you feel about Netanyahu? And everybody had the exact same answer, from the biggest rabbis to the taxi drivers. We don't like him, but he's the right guy for the job. Even if you think he's the wrong guy for the job, then help him do his job don't undermine a government while they're at war. They want to have elections now? That's... Uh, it encourages the enemy, and I hate when that happens. If you enjoyed this conversation or this topic, and you're looking for more information, or you want to hear it again from another angle, there is a way to do that, and that is in this book. It's all there. Order it from Amazon. You can read it, reread it, and share it. We have a Sunday night program for VIPs.
that you might be interested in. It's informal, it's questions and answers, it's conversation. It's really relaxed, it's really pleasant, enjoyable, informative, and uh, kind of community-like. It's a Sunday night program, there's a um, Wednesday morning program for the VIPs, and there's a Wednesday night program. All of it, just conversation, casual, laid back, unscripted. So join us, take a look, click uh, the link below and see which, which of the three suits you best and join us for some enjoyable conversation.